Thank you for being here today. It's been a good day. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I've enjoyed hearing from you. I've enjoyed the presentations. We're going to hear from our board chair, Lyle Knight, in just a few minutes. Um, I, I kept thinking about this chaplain um, uh, presentation that we had today and our experience at 2005. I wanted to share one just quick experience with you. Uh, during the week, we had two chaplains of Subcamp 7 where those leaders were from, from Alaska. Um, the two chaplains were Todd Moody and Paul Moffat, both of them from Las Vegas. They were unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable in their dedication. Midway through the, uh, and, and by the way, I'd been the young man general president for just a year. I hadn't been to a jamboree since 1977 at Moraine State Park, but I'd been asked to be an assistant head chaplain, chaplain so I didn't know what I was doing. But, um, but it didn't make any difference at that jamboree because we were all in from the, like I said, from the moment the youth came until the end. But midweek, I had this feeling, go by and uh, talk with Todd Moody. So I went by subcamp seven and he was there. I said, Todd, come walk with me. And he says, I really can't. He says, I've got so much to do and I've got so many people that, are, that I need to talk to and everything. I said, I'll give you one minute to make arrangements. I said, come walk with me. <laughs> so we did, we walked for an hour. And we just talked and I listened most of the time and he talked. And I asked a few questions and then I, we circled around, ended up at subcamp seven and he went on his way. And at the end of the jamboree, there was a testimony meeting and Todd got up and bore his testimony. And by the way, in the meantime, we had sent him with one of the boys whose father was killed and was one of their troop leaders back to Alaska. And uh, Todd had gone up to Alaska and then he didn't come back. And I said, where's Todd? And he said, well, he went home to Las Vegas. So I called him and he said, uh, I, can't, uh, I can't come back. I couldn't come back until I saw my family after this experience. I said, come back. We need you, but you need to be able to, to uh, uh, have closure from this. And so he came back in the uh, middle of the jamboree, went for this walk. At the end of the jamboree, then got up and bore his testimony, and he made an interesting comment. He said, I learned from my experience here. He says, I've learned a lot of things. But he says, I also learned that every chaplain needs a chaplain. Now, the reason I tell you that is, is because I want you to watch out for each other. We're dedicated, we're devoted, and sometimes we're isolated. No man is an island, but some of you have felt like islands. Because in some cases, you haven't been treated really well by those who should have known better. Uh, they have not see seen your vision and your passion and your desire to keep involved in scouting when the church left. Um, actually, you know... This is a wonderful invitation that President Nelson has given us. He's talked about church, or about family-centered church supporting. This is a wonderful opportunity. Never before in the history of the Boy Scouts of America has scouting been more family-centered than it is now. We just heard this wonderful presentation. That's what this is all about. You can take your whole family and you can uh, go and have a wonderful experience. I don't know whether I told you about this last uh, March, but when I was when we were in Yuma a year ago, I went to a, a um, an Episcopal or a uh, Presbyterian church, and there they had a scout troop, they had a cub pack, they had the wee blows. Uh, a number of them were Latter Day Saint leaders in this. Uh, they had a lot of the girls there, and parents could go there and. The guy that was giving me the tour said, and oh, by the way, there are a lot of parents that are involved in this, but in this corner right here, the parents, if they're not involved in scouting, are in a Bible study program. We're all in. This is more family supported than ever before. The difference is, is for 107 years, the church made the decision as to who would be in scouting. 
Now parents have to make the decision as to who's going to be in scouting or who's going to spend all of their time in sporting. And you heard some statistics. I wish we would have had more time to hear what Wayne said because those studies, in fact, that's probably something, Neil, that we ought to put on the web because there is so much of good so far as non-Latter-day Saint, non-scouting research that shows that scouting does make a difference. And it's especially eye-opening with those who are of a religious background. Unbelievable what scouting does. So um, every chaplain needs a chaplain, so watch out for each other and watch out for yourself, will you? You know, uh, uh, in uh, The Hobbit, Gandalf gets ready to leave and he turns to Bilbo Baggins and he says, be good, take care of yourself, and don't leave the path. And so I just say, be, care be careful, take care of yourself, don't leave the path, but also take care of each other. Now, we've been here for a full day. I'm going to turn some time over to Lyle Knight in just a minute as chairman of our board, but I want to open it up just for five minutes for any general questions that you might have that we could answer. We're not going to take long. You've had opportunities to ask specific questions in each of your sessions, but uh, do you have, uh, what questions do you have? And I'm, going to, I'm just going to check. It's 3.22 now, and we're going to end at that at 3, at uh, 2.30 the latest yes please um, it was briefly mentioned earlier could you share a little bit about what's been done about um, becoming truly international yes I, I will indeed um, when the church goes into a certain area um, they grow by selective neglect okay they grow from centers of strength we have felt like for the first four to five years we have needed to solidify what's happening here in the United States because this is where we are. This is where our, our center is. But we do have pockets of Latter-day Saints that are involved in scouting in the Orient. We have pockets down in uh, the, um, in the, um, the Polynesian culture countries in Tahiti. Tahiti used to have a huge scout organization. Uh, down in Latin America, also in Russia, interestingly enough. And so we are in the process of uh, recruiting uh, a new um, uh, vice president for international. Hugh Red has done that. We've uh, invited Hugh, and he has accepted to be on the on the board of Vanguard. Some many of you don't know Hugh. He's been the area president for the Northeast region of the Boy Scouts of America. He is very very competent. He is the president or the uh, chairman of the board of West of Southern Virginia University. Some of you know Bonnie Cor Corden. She's the new president there. She was the young women general president and very competent. So Hugh is there and we're glad to have him on our board, but we're looking now to expand there. You'll hear more about that within the next 12 months, okay. But Neil mentioned a little bit more about what we're going to be doing and that is we're going to be developing in a pilot area yet to be determined and all out where you will not be able to turn or walk down the street or go to the theater or go to a, a community softball game or a university activity or whatever without seeing something about scouting. And then we're going to package that and uh, then take it to various pockets throughout the country, starting with areas of strength. So. We're going to start out, you know, areas along the Wasatch Corridor there. We had five people here from Boise. Boise is a strong Latter-day Saint Council. You know, down in, in through Utah and Washington County down to Phoenix, we've got uh, some areas, the, the uh, uh, San Diego Imperial Council, uh, Las Vegas, some of the other areas. Interestingly enough, um, Dolly, uh, uh, Raleigh, Dar Durham, uh, North Carolina and uh, Capital Area Council and there are other areas. So there are some exciting areas there, but that's more than what you asked for. Another question. Yes, please, David. Uh, last year you mentioned about Vanguard representatives for each council to have someone representing the, the program in each council. What is the status of that? And how can we find out who these people are so that they can get uh, use them as a resource to strengthen scouting the other we have found that um, we do have councils. Neil, do you remember, Trevor's not here, but do you remember how many uh, we have? 
how many BSCRs we have? Yeah, we've got about 36. About 36, but in some ways they're, uh, they're uh, isolated in their council. They're, they're not even members of the Religious Relationships Committee, which is what they're supposed to be and what we, have, what we asked the council key three to do. So we're in the process of shoring that up, giving them some specific responsibilities there. Um, I would say on a scale of one to 10, I would give it a three. Neil, is that pretty accurate? As far as it's, as far as it's, uh, uh, it's uh, effectiveness so far, um, but, uh, but we're working on it and it's an area that we do need to work on. With regard to uh, finding out who's there, do we have anything on our website that has a list of Vanguard Council reps? Okay, great. Thanks, Dave, for that question. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, let me just tell you that uh, for about the first two years of Vanguard's operation, we had a board, and it was a wonderful board, a very strong board that included both of the Perrys, and, and um, it included Todd Moody, and I told you about Todd down in Las Vegas, and Jake Nickel, former president of CE and CEO of um, of Leatherman Tool Company, it included Gordon Gee, the president of West Virginia University, it included uh, Lyle Knight, who um, was on our board. It was a very strong board, but I'll tell you, I felt so alone because we had no board chairman. And um, the board then elected uh, Lyle as a chair, and it, he has been an absolute delight. And um, not because he's just supportive, but he sometimes asks the tough questions and he puts my feet to the fire and it's so good to have somebody to be able to do that. He's the consummate board chairman. And so um, we've asked Lyle to take some time. And so Lyle, the, if you'd come on up here and, and uh, he and his wife um, live in uh, Billings, Montana, and he's come all the way down here and, and he's been involved in the National Executive Board and has been heavily involved in scouting. He's a banker by trade, has been in Arizona and other places throughout the country, Billings, Montana. He's been a very successful bank president, but most of all, he's a good guy and a good scouter and a wonderful Latter-day Saint. So, uh, Lyle, thank you very much for all you do. <laughs> Oh, Charles, thank you, thank you. I'm a tough guy to introduce. My wife has the same problem in introducing me. See, I'm an underachiever, so it's hard to make it sound professional and, and interesting. Um, so, Charles, next time, are you, just introduce me as the banker, because everyone knows that a banker is merely an economist that lack the personality to become an accountant. <laughs> so that's not bad. I got all you economists, accountants, and bankers in one shot. So that felt pretty good. Charles wanted me to explain a little bit about the governance of this organization that you're so deeply involved in. Because there's two boards of directors, or I guess one you'd call them, organizational committee but they're the ones that do all the work and you see them running around here uh, all day they're the ones that make all this happen and they report to Charles and they're responsible for the day-to-day -day activities of Vanguard then there's an 11 person board of directors who understand the difference between delivering the program and governing the program. So we don't get involved at all in, in delivering things. So you don't see us. We're, we're not highly visible, nor should we be, because we're to be in the background. You've met four of us today. You've Charles, of course, and Chris, and, and Wayne, and me. That's four of the 11, but the rest are kind of shadows, if you will. But they're charged with helping create uh, a mission, uh, corporate mission for the organization. Uh, they're charged with the responsibility of selecting a CEO and then evaluating the CEO. They're charged with uh, the responsibility of raising funds for these things that we do. So
so this is a board that's made up of people that have served on corporate boards and have a, a keen understanding of governance and, and know the difference between governance and management. So I want to spend a few minutes of the time that I have and uh, teach you by, I'm going to say by parables. You know, recently we've been all taught in the church to teach in the Savior's way. So the Savior uses parables. So I want to be careful because I often wondered why Lehi said to his three sons, I want you to go back and get the plates that Laban has. I mean, did he know the plates had Isaiah on them? <laughs> but he sent him back to get the plates, and then he began to read them to his children. There's parables in there, but they're from Isaiah. And then I learned that Isaiah was only 100 years older than Levi, than Lehi. So Lehi understood the same economy, the same geography, the same beliefs of the people, because his dates and Isaiah's are only 100 years apart. We try to read it today, it's 2,000 years apart, so it's hard for us to relate. So my parables are modern day parables, so hopefully that you can uh, relate a little more towards scouting. So there is a guy in Arizona, his name is uh, Gary Ellsworth, he's a noted CPA, business consultant, smart guy, and I left Arizona 30 some years ago. Well, he calls me a few years ago just to renew a friendship. And I say to him, how are your little boys? And he said, well, Lyle, it's been a long time since we've spoken. My little boys are all men, and they're all three physicians. One's a professor, and the other two are practicing physicians. He said, but something I want to share with you that they told me happened to them in their interviews for medical school. He said the interviewing panel, and he said they all went to three different Ivy League medical schools at three different times. But each time the panel said, we see on your application that you're LDS. So we would have expected that you've served a mission, and we see that you have. They said, uh, secondly, we would expect that you would be a good student or you wouldn't be applying here at Stanford. And we see that you are. But what's unique about your application is it says here you're an Eagle Scout. So we would like for you to explain to the panel what you learned during your Eagle project. Three different schools, three different times, three different candidates, but they all had the same question. What did you learn during your Eagle project? So they got set apart, if you will, because they had an experience that many of the other applicants didn't have. And they credit that Eagle Scout badge with helping them uh, get into the medical school. Second parable, there's a man named Randy Swinson in Montana, owns a, a string of assisted living centers, very wealthy man. Uh, he stops me one day and says, I want to tell you about two letters that I have from my son. He says, the first letter is when my son was at the MTC. And he said in the letter, Dad, I'm nervous about being here as a missionary. I don't, I don't feel like I've properly prepared. Uh, I should have done more. I'm just nervous about going out preaching the gospel. He said, but I walked by a planter box here in uh, Provo and heard two other missionaries conversing. And the one said, man, I'm not ready for this. He said, I, I, I don't even know the 12 articles of faith. <laughs> now, for those of you that haven't been in primary for a while, there's 13. <laughs> That's the hidden joke in what he overheard. Well, secondly, he reads this other letter to me, and his son, same young man, is in Mexico, and he says, Dad, 
He said, I was traveling with my companion across Mexico City, and the federalities pulled our bus over. And it was full of Mexican people, and then the two of us. And I said to my companion, I'm in trouble because my visa has expired and I haven't told anybody. So I'm going to be, you know, probably arrested. Please make sure the mission president knows where I'm at. And everybody was unloaded on the bus. Everybody's papers were checked. And sure enough, they held his son back. And while everyone was on the bus, the federalities went through his son's wallet and looked at every document in the wallet. You know, the license to preach, a driver's license, everything he had, and pulled out his Eagle Scout card and told him that he could get back on the bus. So here is an internationally recognized achievement that professes to this young man's character in so much that he was in Mexico and did not get in trouble for having an expired visa. So you have an example nationally of people getting into medical school because of their association with us and now uh, being in Mexico and uh, not getting in trouble uh, because of their association. My third parable comes from another leading citizen. Uh, she's in North Carolina. Uh, our family name is Rock, and so she was supposed to be a boy. Uh, she didn't come out as a boy, so she was named Rochelle, uh, but we call her Rocky. So it's my daughter that I'm referring to. And she has four children in Scouts, both her daughters and both her sons. And she's telling me the difference between community scouting and church scouting, because she's experienced both. And she says, it's unbelievable that, you know, I deliver my kids, uh, and the scoutmaster says, now, for us to uh, be scoutmasters to your kid, you're required to give us, uh, and I forget the number, but 15 hours a month volunteer time. You're also required to do this financially, and you're, you're required to be a merit badge counselor. And said, man, the whole family is just roped into this uh, and she said, and, and we've got four in the program. She said, but it's unique because there are lots of Indians, primarily Indians. And North Carolina doesn't have any Indians. And she says, oh, no, I, I, these are people from India that have uh, immigrated to the United States. And I said, oh, I understand. I said, why the attraction to scouting? And she says, because they are so focused on their children's future that they've got this chance to be in America and be successful, they know their kids have to fill out a resume, and they want scouting and Eagle Scouts on that resume. Wow. So here you have foreigners that realize the value for their children to have an experience in scouting. Well, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm spending my time working in the shadows, uh, watching you out there on the line, because I want LDS kids not to be robbed of that opportunity to have that on their, on their resume, uh, to be able to compete, if you will. Because think about it, these kids someday they're going to be applying to medical schools. They're going to be applying to law schools. If they're really sharp, they're going to be applying to banking schools. <laughs> One bullet, got three of them, Wayne, <laughs> Charles, Matt. <laughs> so my point is, for our kids to have an advantage or a leg up or maybe just get on a level playing field, scouting gets them there. So I want their families to know that and I want them to make the conscious decision whether to join or not to join, but not to have it available doesn't feel right to me. So those are my uh, three parables, if you will. 
I am just excited uh, to be here. I learned something. And I was thinking, as Charles was talking, I registered as, an, a, scout, as a, a scout the first time 70 years ago. And for one way or another, I've been involved in this movement for 70 years. Uh, a couple of years in the Army and then back to, to scouting activities. Uh, and yet I can sit here today with you and learn something that after 70 years you'd think I'd know it all, but I, I don't. I learn something uh, every time. So I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you for uh, giving me a few minutes on your agenda to, to share some parables and uh, have a good, uh, I guess, trip home when the, the meeting's over. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle, for doing that. We're uh, grateful for his leadership. Now, I have a couple of things that I wanted to share with you, and Neil, if we could cue those, that would be great. We wanted you to know, and I've asked um, Lyle for the opportunity to share this with you uh, uh, before our board has sanctioned it. We've discussed it as an operations team. Lyle has reviewed it. This will be the first time that Wayne and Chris have seen it, but every unit needs its core values. This may change a little bit because it'll go through the board at our next uh, quarterly board meeting, which happens in May. Uh, but there are three items that are very important to us as to who we are, and uh, we felt like it was important for you to know who Vanguard is, and that is the first one is loyalty. We are loyal to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, our, we, we want nothing to be inconsistent. We want everyone to know that uh, we follow a prophet. And when we talk about this choice, and the, some of you may have real heartburn, I guess we all do, about uh, what happened on 1-1-2020, but we follow a prophet. And uh, when he focused on the family and on church support of family, then it's up to us to be able to help him do what he feels inspired to do by strengthening those families and giving those families um, opportunities and options for their children. Our loyalty goes down to the six areas that have already been talked about in the Duty to God Award and in the Light and Truth Award. And if you look at each one of them, you'll see that that loyalty runs very deep because everything that our young people do and everything our leaders do in earning those two awards is to help them to be better Latter-day Saints. Everything it, that happens. And uh, if you look at the faith, uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and living the gospel of Jesus Christ and family and mission preparation and uh, service and church history and church government, all of those help those individuals. If you look at the requirements, and, and I will tell you, I challenge each one of you between now and next year to be able to earn the Duty to God Award, you'll find that it enriches your life more than you can imagine. I think I've shared with you my experience in memorizing the living Christ and the wonderful experience I had in, in reciting that to Zella and getting to one part of talking about the Savior as the Prophet Joseph described the Savior, and I couldn't go any further. And I was overwhelmed with this feeling that this is not only the Prophet's testimony, but it's mine. That's the reason we have these young men and young women um, memorize the scout oath and the scout law and scriptures. But that experience with the living Christ taught me this is the right thing for them to do. And every young man and every young woman that earns their duty to God award has not done something easy. They've done something hard. They've seen every part of the church that the, that the, the First Presidency and the Twelve want them to be involved in. Family home evening, come follow me, youth activities. Uh, the proclamation to the family, the proclamation on the restoration, the living Christ, uh, the church magazines, uh, um, uh, general conference, all of those things is to help them. You go through all of those and you'll see that it helps them to be a better, better Latter-day Saint. Now the second area of, the, of our core values is consistency. Uh, and that is, if you'll see the consistency uh, up there, uh, it's consistent with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is restored. If you just look at the description of uh, in uh, the last verse of the second uh, of uh, Luke 2, where it talks about Jesus increased in, 
in, in uh, Jesus increased in stature and something and in, and in fellowship with God and man. Those three, it talks about spiritual, it talks about physical, it talks about social, and it talks about uh, intellectual. Those are not new. This, was, this is Luke, but if you have a copy of the book, uh, I dare you, and if you don't have a copy, go online and see if you can find it. In fact, I dare you to because I think I've bought every one. And I've given it to all of our grandchildren. But I'll tell you, it's those four areas that are so important for us to build rounded individuals. There was a sign on, the, on a Protestant uh, church years ago as I walked by it on the way to pick Zella up from her apartment when we were both at BYU and dating, and it says the Lord expects spiritual food, not gospel nuts. And, and gospel nuts come from being unbalanced. Scouting helps us to be balanced. The gospel of Jesus Christ is balanced. We want to be balanced in all of those four areas, and that includes family, that includes uh, competency in our work responsibilities, it includes spirituality, it means being physically fit, and um, all of those things that help us, and it is consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fourth core value is relevance. Never before have the principles of scouting been more relevant than they are today. I think they are more needed than ever before as we see our youth spend so much time on their uh, machines. In fact, it just breaks my heart when I see these young people walking down the street. It's a gorgeous day. The, the sky is out, the flowers are out, and, and it's and they're locked into earbuds and to their machines. They're walking down the sheen, the sheen texting to somebody else. I'm not um, surprised a little bit by Wayne's comment today about how many texts our youth do each day because they're constantly doing that. They need this opportunity for scouting. They need to be able to develop leadership and character development. They need to know what it is to be a part of a team and to be able to work with other individuals, to develop real resiliency. I love the presentation on resiliency today. If there's anything that the missionary department is focusing on, on missionary preparation, it's building resilient youth. We need youth who will know how to deal with difficult times. They need to be able to send missionaries into China and Russia and places that we can't go right now and where they'll be so far away from their mission president that they won't see their mission president for six months. I didn't see my mission president for very long and I was in Switzerland because he just trusted us and we were out there doing our job. We need resilient young men and young women and then lifelong learning. There's a reason why they call it commencement. <laughs> it's because it's just the beginning. The fourth principle is engagement and that is getting our individuals involved in life around us and scouting locks people in and engages them in that which is good and true and right and, and uh, strengthens them, we believe that, the, that this area of engagement is what uh, determines our core outcome, and that is we believe as a Vanguard Scouting Association that uh, the more Latter-day Saints that are involved uh, in scouting, the closer and the stronger their testimonies will be, the more active they will be as Latter-day Saints, the better mission, they will be not only uh, an increased number of missionaries, but they will be better missionaries. They will have skills and abilities that will help them to be effective missionaries and to be finishers. And for that reason, we are all in. We wanted you to just know about those values as you think about this day that you've had today as we've talked about Vanguard. Now, um, I just have one, I think one more thing that I want to share with you, and we can put the lights up if we could, Neil. Um, actually, a couple of things. First, I want to express appreciation to our operations team. Lyle mentioned this operations team of extremely competent individuals who have been responsible for this Vanguard Vision Conference. And I will tell you, my at, you'll laugh, Matt, because my wife has asked me a number of questions. And I have said, I'm sorry, I don't know. She said, you're the president of this. Why don't you know? I said, it's beyond my pay grade. I just don't know. I delegated it to somebody who was so competent 
that I don't know how many people are going to be here. I don't know how many people were going to be there yesterday. I don't know what's happening here, but it went wonderfully. So kudos to Dr. McKiff. <clears throat> and would you, all of those of you who are on our operations team, would you please stand? And Rachel, please join us as well. And Gary and Laura, would you please stand as well? First, our operations team, and then all of those who are participating as our faculty today. All of those participating as our faculty today, okay. Yeah, Mary Jane, that's you too, so. Okay, thank you very much. Now, anybody know what this is? What is it? It's not just a bolo, it's a? It's a dollar bolo, that's right. I first became aware, not of dollar bolos, but of birch bolos at Philmont Scout Ranch in 1986. We took 100 kids during two weeks and brought them down to Philmont Scout Ranch to teach them um, about Aaronic priesthood exploring. They came from all over the country. They came, many of them, with their stake presidents. We were at Rayado, the stake presidents were at the Philmont Training Center, and we taught them about Aaronic priesthood exploring. Bill Price was a master. I was his assistant. I was a sitting stake president at the time. And at the end of our presentation, as we went into the, all of the stake presidents and their families there in the auditorium and we sang for them, there was an old coot, which he called himself, <laughs> that was standing near the door with bolos around his arm. And as the boys would leave, after singing, he would give each of them a bolo tie. Now that old coot was Bill Burge, and he died with what, almost 50,000? Yeah, <laughs> approximately what Gary said, okay? <laughs> but there was one who cared enough about establishing the tradition and carrying on after Bill left that Gary started carving with Bill. And uh, to the point where they were almost identical. One day I said to Bill, can you tell the difference between yours and Gary's? Now, with Bill, Bill would carve them and he would paint them. Gary carved them and Laura painted them. So one day we said, okay, let's do a test. So we did. And we had two bolos right there. And Bill looked at him and he says, well, I know that one's mine for certain. We turned it around and it said dollar on it <laughs> and he knew he was in and um, so I've loved these two good men and this wonderful woman for a lot of years but you know um, last night as I was looking through some things in our cabin I found this <laughs> this is not a dollar bolo this is a five string banjo it is partly a dollar bolo because after a Dahlquist carved it, a dollar painted it. <laughs> it reminded me as I looked at that, that um, Gary doesn't carve the bolos for the bolos' sake. If you could watch this great leader at a jamboree where beginning early in the morning and uh, going into the day until he has used up his day's allotment of bolo ties. He has 10, 11, 12 young men, young women sitting around in a half circle listening to him talk about scouting values. And um, then he gives each of them a, a bolo tie. Now those bolo ties are worn with pride around them and I've seen them as he gets, he finishes and then he has them all stand up. They all raise their arm to the square and they commit to live the principles of the Scout Oath and Law. It is powerful. And I learned that uh, Gary doesn't carve these nor did Bill carve them for the sake of the bolo ties. The bolo tie is just a vehicle to get into the lives and the hearts of those young men and to give them an experience that they will never forget as long as they live. Now Gary just showed me a picture of the two of us carving on the cliffs of Dover. 2007, when we went to the World Scout Jamboree. Now I treasure these. 
but my posterity will treasure this. But they will ever be grateful for Gary Dollar for helping me to know that I could do something. Because you see, I'm not very skillful. (laughs) I don't have those skills. But even at my age, and my mind tells me I'm 23, my my wife reminds me that I am not. (laughs) But even at my age, it is a period of lifelong learning. I learned to carve a bolo tie. It's not something that I've done much of. I'm learning to speak Spanish. I take weekly Spanish lessons. I'm learning to work with wood. I make charcuterie. Uh, uh, trays and all kinds of things because of the faith in me that you gave me. And I will tell you that just as my posterity will cherish this, they may not know that Gary Dollar was the one that helped me to believe in myself and that I could do something. Just as the posterity of those that you teach today may not know the impact that you've had in the lives of their posterity and those who have gone before, those who were your scouts, those who were your Cub Scouts, those who were maybe one of the first Eagle, young women Eagle um, in your part of the city or maybe the state or whatever. They will not know about you, but they will ever be grateful for your example and for teaching them the scout oath and law Not only to memorize it, but to live it, because that's what this is all about. I firmly believe that Baden Powell was inspired when he began this great movement. All of those great things that the prophets and apostles have said about scouting are not negated by what happened on 1 1 2020. Maybe they're even amplified because it makes our job harder. But we are committed to do hard things. And so today, I hope you've taken some notes. I hope you've made some resolves. I'm going to invite you to join me in inviting one more adult to get involved in scouting in the next six months. There are so many out there who would love to be involved, who are just a little afraid, who don't understand, but who really miss their scouting involvement. We need them. We need them on committees. And if they're not willing to come in as a scoutmaster, invite them to be a a merit badge counselor or something to get the hook in and get them involved. Then invite them to some of your campouts. Get them to, to sit around a campfire again and to be able to feel this great spirit of scouting. I've never found that a bishop or a stake president or anybody caught the vision of scouting by us yapping at them. (laughs) It doesn't happen. It happens around a campfire where they can see that we're here to support them. All they want to do is help their young men and their young women to be good, to live the values of the kingdom to be prepared for missions, to serve missions, to be married in the temple and to be prepared for eternity. And that's all we want. This isn't about Vanguard. When we met at the upper room of the uh, Zions Bank building to give Harris Simmons a distinguished eagle a while ago, we walked away from there with thousands of dollars being given to scouting. Harris was going to pay for the breakfast. And I called him up and I said, Harris, that's very nice of you, but you're not funding your own ceremonies breakfast. Vanguard is going to pay for it. So we paid $5,000. It was a budget item for us, but all of the money and all of the kudos went to scouting because that's what this is all about. When the billboards come up, when the placards go on the playbills, it's not going to be about Vanguard. It's going to be about the boy and the girl, the young man and the young woman, about those of us who are still scouting. God bless you for who you are, for being part of this great program. It is a divinely inspired program. None of that has changed. God bless you for who you are and for all you're doing for the rising generation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.